so it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, His Grace Sudhyakta Narsimha Dasa, a distinguished senior Gaudiya Vaishnava monk, who will be speaking today on the topic of human intelligence in the age of artificial intelligence. He is currently serving as the president of the Hare Krishna Movement Temple in Chennai. Uh, he completed his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and later joined the ISKCON Bangalore Monastery in 1999. Since then, he has been actively engaged in lecturing on religious and societal issues, delivering talks at prestigious universities across North America and India, including Harvard, MIT, Rutgers, IITs, and IIMs. He is widely recognized for his talks on the Mahabharata, the great Indian epic. As a practitioner of Bhakti Yoga, he has also conducted various spiritual workshops worldwide. We are honored to have Narsimha Prabhu share his wisdom and expertise with us. Um, and okay, we can now proceed with uh, our program. Thank you. Very happy to be here amongst all of you, and it is my pleasure and privilege to share a little bit of my thoughts from what of my experience. Okay, welcome, Prabhu, and uh, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, to start off with, uh, Prabhu, can you tell us uh, what exactly is intelligence and is there anything unique about human intelligence? So there, I think there are many definitions of intelligence uh, you know, is there like for us to learn about, but uh, from your perspective, what actually is intelligence? Yes, uh, intelligence is, uh, has become a hot topic nowadays, what with chat CPT and AI and all that stuff. So. And we also know that there are several measures of intelligence. One of the uh, most commonly used measures of intelligence is IQ. But with time, now we are also looking, uh, looking at emotional quotient, EQ, spiritual quotient, SQ, etc. And also there have been other multiple theories also. There is like, I think it was uh, one Gardner who proposed that there are eight kinds of intelligence, etc. So, there are many things floating around. Uh, without touching all of that, I would like to share with you what the Vedic scriptures speak about intelligence. Uh, there is a uh, scripture in the Vedas, which is part of the Vedas, which is called Srimad Bhagavatam. And this Srimad Bhagavatam was uh, compiled, it was written 5,000 years ago. So, a very ancient scripture. So, interestingly, this uh, scripture talks about the body that we all have. And normally, in medical science and in our biology classes and all that, we learn about our body, that it has so many organs and, and different components like blood, flesh, etc. But the Bhagavatam, uh, what it does is, it looks at the body a little differently. It looks at the whole body as being comprised of two components. One is the body which we all see. It is called the gross body. Hands, eyes, ears, etc. And over and above that, the Bhagavatam says there is a subtle body also. So the subtle body comprises mind, intelligence and the sense of identity. So these three also is considered part of the body. Like, you know, when we say subtle body, you can compare the gross body to uh, hardware of a computer and uh, the subtle body to be something like a software. It's just a you know, uh, uh, crude idea, crude example. Now, the Bhagavatam describes what are the characteristics of each of these components, especially of the subtle body. What are the functions of the mind? What are the functions of intelligence? And about the intelligence, a very wonderful analysis is given in the Bhagavatam and it say and it and the way it describes intelligence I would like to share with all of you. It's very interesting with some examples so that we can understand it better. Like all of you are students, you will know in your class there will be all kinds of uh, students. There are the front benches, there are the middle benches, back benches, etc. Isn't it? They are there in every, uh, you know, they are this you know kind of classification you can do in any college, in any university you go. Now, when the teacher comes to the class, the, there will be a few students who will always be asking questions. Whenever the teacher teaches any subject, 
there will be some students who are, you know, always prompt to ask questions, very, uh, and the teacher will also be very happy to hear the questions and answer them. And those students who are always asking questions, the teacher will mark, oh, this is an intelligent boy or intelligent girl. So what we can understand, the Bhagavatam says, doubting is one of the functions of intelligence. And we all innately know this, isn't it? So, the, one of the functions of intelligence is to doubt. Another uh, function of intelligence is, like for example, if you have some friends in your classroom, who can remember very clearly whatever is taught in the classroom, and uh, some of us are like, you know, how many ever times we go and study and, and uh, revise the subject matter that doesn't enter, enter our head. But there are some guys who are able to remember everything very quickly. So whenever the teacher asks a question, this will be the guy, first guy to raise his hand. So when you look at a guy whose memory is very sharp, what do you say? This guy is very intelligent. So the Bhagavatam says the second function of intelligence is memory, to remember things. Now, the another function of intelligence Suppose you have a mobile phone and you come across a new app. Many of us will be, you know, will, when we look at a new app, we will figure out how to use it, how to uh, how to open it and and all its uh, use all its features, etc. Some people will be, you know, they will they will not be able to get around anything. It will be very difficult for them to understand how to use a phone itself. But some guys are so sharp, they will very quickly pick up the, uh, this one app also, they will use also, and they will hack it also. <laughs> so, so these guys, they, they very quickly grasp things. So this ability to apprehend the, uh, an object for what it is, and, you, and to be able to grasp its use, and to use it, to put it to full use, is another aspect of intelligence. It's another function of intelligence. Then, one more function of intelligence is to give direction. Like for example, you know, uh, if you have to go from one place to another place, we want the directions to go from MIT to uh, somewhere else, or we want to go from Stanford to somewhere else. What we do, we put the Google Maps and we get the directions how to. So direction essentially means, if you want to uh, if you want to achieve something, if you want to get some result, you have to go through various steps to come to the final result, isn't it? Suppose you want to get into Stanford. There are many, many uh, applications, forms, so many criteria that you have to fulfill. There are so many small, small steps that you need to cover to come to the final goal. Some people, what happens is, they, they, they just cannot comprehend, you know, what are all the steps involved in a procedure. And every step will be a surprise for them. But there will be some people who will, you know, once they read, go through some document which explains all the steps, then very quickly and easily they will be able to fulfill everything and complete everything. So when we look at such people, we say, this guy is so sharp here. Yeah. I am struggling to figure out how to do this, and this guy in a, like this, in a matter of uh, minutes, he has finished it. So direction is another function of intelligence. And one more function, interestingly, of the, this is the most interesting function of intelligence. You all would have observed that, you know, sometimes when the exams are close, you do night out and, you know, put in extra hours of uh, reading and all that. So what happens is you, you, you sacrifice sleep and uh, try, to, uh, try to study more so that you, can, you, can, you, can, you are well prepared for the examination. So what happens is when you are sacrificing the sleep, after a certain amount of time, what will happen? Your brain will freeze. You will not be able to think anymore. So you will say that time should shut up. And you will go and sleep. So sleep is also a function of intelligence. Without proper sleep, intelligence cannot function properly. So these are all the functions of intelligence which is described in the Bhagavata. So intelligence you know, intelligence has to, intelligence means all these functions have to be present in, when we speak of a human intelligence. 
when we speak of artificial intelligence, we incorporate certain elements of these certain functions of the intelligence. Like for instance, when we speak of artificial intelligence, there is a huge database of all kinds of information which is present and you draw from that and you can use it. And so for that you have several terabytes of memory which is built into the computers today. So memory has been, has been, has been, uh, you know, in artificial intelligence we have managed to uh, create memories which, which are identical to the human memory. So similarly, we have Google Maps which shows you the direction. Again, use of artificial intelligence. You, you, it will calculate all the different kinds of uh, traffic in different zones and then it will show you the shortest route or the, or the uh, route which can take you to the final destination in the shortest time. So direction also has been, we have been managed to incorporate into artificial intelligence. So when we look at intelligence, you know, the, the uh, whatever artificial we have intelligence we have today, is will be mimicking one of these functions of intelligence, one or more of these functions. So from the, when we look at uh, intelligence from the perspective of the Vedic or the uh, scriptural understanding, we can get a very wonderful uh, definition of how intelligence functions and we will be able to also uh, in our day-to-day -day life, we will be able to see how intelligence is working, how mind is working, how our sense of identity is working, etc. So, uh, you know, a, a very wonderful, <coughs> a very wonderful analysis of the subtle body is given in the Vedic scriptures like this. Uh, thank you, Prabhu, for that answer. Uh, just one small follow-up question. So, you mentioned Chat GPT. Like, yeah. uh, this is a system which can like answer like just about any question which you can think of. True. And I've actually tried asking it questions about the Gita, also, like you know, very simple questions like you know, like this is the verse. Tell me what its meaning is. Mm. And it seems to have a pretty good understanding of it. Like you would probably get a similar answer like even from like a qualified teacher, but teacher would give you like more insight into it, but yeah. it's not like it's answering it wrongly. Like, yeah, true. But just because it's answering it, we cannot consider it as like an intelligent system, like yes. which is uh, something which has actually understood the spiritual knowledge. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's maybe. Yeah, yeah, true, because what happens is, like I said, intelligence has got many functions, all right? Now, intelligence is also not the living entity. The living entity is different from the intelligence because like I mentioned, intelligence, the mind, the sense of identity, these are also bodies, meaning they are also part of this machine. The, the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Yantra Anima This body is like actually a sophisticated machine in which there are two components, the gross part of it and the subtle part of it. So, uh, the, the, the intelligence is also part of the machine. So just because we are able to artificially recreate that intelligence or we are able to make an imitation intelligence of the kind of intelligence we have, doesn't mean that the living entity itself has been replicated. So just like we have a robot which can perform the functions of like what we use our hands, clasping something, picking up something, keeping it somewhere else, etc. Right? There are so many robotic uh, things we have invented, hydraulics and all that kind of stuff using that to mimic the action of our hand. But that does not mean that if I have a robot which is able to pick up and uh, place objects in another place, that does not mean that I myself have been replicated. Either, you know, one part of the body we have replicated. So similarly, intelligence is also part of this machine. So we have, we have duplicated the machine, one part of the machine only. So that so always the living entity will be different from its body, whether gross or subtle. So even if artificial intelligence we are able to create, it does not mean that we have conquered life, because life is a completely different uh, subject matter altogether. Right. That's what, that's how I would look at it. Yeah. Uh, well, we have a question from the audience, but I think we'll do that after we finish the talk. Yeah, so maybe just to segue into the next question, right? Um, so what exactly are the limits of artificial intelligence? Like, it, can it can we actually like get close to human intelligence or like we'll only be able to mimic it and, you know, can it really become uh, like a human? Like? That's an interesting question. So what happens is, you see, in this world, scientists, uh, with the advancement of science and technology, 
we have been able to create machines which perform functions what human beings or any living entities can do on a far better scale. For example, we have to go from one place to another, right? So if I want to go from one place to another, I will walk and go. That's how my body is, or my body is designed. Or I can run and go at the rest. Now what uh, science has done, we have invented modes of transport like cars, aeroplanes, etc., which can perform the function of commutation much better than I can ever do, right? But that does not mean human beings themselves have to be replaced. We have invented, we have discovered, or we have, uh, you know, uh, technology has managed to develop cars and bikes and, and all kinds of transport systems. Which has, and even aeroplanes which can fly, which human beings cannot do. But that does not mean that the world will be taken over by aeroplanes and cars and all that. Human beings will continue to use them to do our work in a more efficient and in a better way. That's what will happen. Similarly, artificial intelligence also is, it will help human beings to do their whatever their works are in a much better, more efficient manner. So just like in the olden days when we had to do calculations, when we had to work with numbers, we would do it on our fingers or, you know, we had abacus and all those kind of uh, crude instruments with which we could do the calculation. But when it, later on, we invented the calculators which can calculate much faster, bigger numbers, etc. So human beings have been able to do their work more efficiently, but does not mean calculators have replaced all the accountants and all those uh, people who are doing those calculations. No, they have only helped them to do their work better. So in a similar way, whatever artificial intelligence is coming up with, it will help us to improve our way of working, but to, to replace human beings with artificial intelligence in the sense that Okay, some jobs people may lose, but they will find other jobs which will which will be more suited for using the artificial intelligence better in their job. But ultimately, you know, replacing humans in the sense that human race itself will be replaced by AI, that's not going to happen. This is not a movie like Terminator where, when, you know, you have a software taking over and all that. That's not going to happen. So, all movies and all, it will be fine to look at that. But... In the reality, that will never happen. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think I kind of agree with what you say that humans cannot be replaced. But uh, one thing which I've been thinking about is, uh, so, like, we have actually been shaped by AI in some way, right? Like, there's AI tools which are out there which can help you yeah. create images or, like, you know, answer your questions. That it's sort of, it's influencing our personality and our True. intelligence. So, how should we, like, be, should we be careful of this or, like, you know, what are the ethical considerations we should think about? Okay, you see, what happens is, whenever uh, science comes up with some breakthrough uh, technology or innovation, it will always result in cultural changes in the entire society. Like for instance, uh, before, uh, you know, uh, the year, I think 2001 or 2002 or whatever, uh, we, you know, the, we did not have uh, smartphones, we did not have tablets, but with the advent of smartphones and tablets and, and uh, touchscreen mobiles, we are able to communicate with other people, do, do video calls and such stuff. And with that came the advent of social media. So social media has impacted the way we interact with people, how we make friends. We have more friends virtually than we have live friends. And uh, you know, and uh, the way we interact, behave, all those things that has influenced in a very big way. So whenever there are breakthrough innovations, it will impact the culture of the people, the way they work, the way they uh, interact with each other, all these things will get impacted. Now, how artificial intelligence is going to impact all these things, that I believe only time will tell us. But we will, you know, every innovation that comes, comes with its positive and negative sides. Nothing is totally bad, nothing is totally positive also. Like for example, when atomic energy was invented, when nuclear energy was invented, you know, the entire ramifications might not have been known to the person who discovered nuclear energy. But what has happened is nuclear energy has benefited so many people with the production of energy, clean energy and those kind of stuff. And at the same time, it has also lent itself to 
to, to negative things like the creation of the atom, the nuclear bomb and the atomic bomb. And there is always the fear, if it falls into wrong hands, it can create great havoc. So similarly, artificial intelligence also, it will have its good uses, but we will have to be very uh, careful. If it falls into the wrong hands, it can create great havoc. But the hands of good people, it will always, they will always, people will always come up with good uses for it, which will benefit humankind. Uh, to be more specific, like in what ways do you think like AI can uh, help enhance human intelligence? Well, uh, you know, like we have already seen, like you mentioned, now, you know, uh, all of you don't have to do your homework. It's much easier for all of you. <laughs> I'm just joking. But if you look at all the functions that human beings would have to struggle and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, put in a lot of effort to do, it will ease all those activities. By that, what's happening is, Time will get saved. You will be able to come up with much better, uh, uh, you know, uh, much better uh, output, and uh, this will naturally improve the efficiency of the people. There are multiple benefits like that. I'm sure, you know, as we go along, we'll be able to understand more about AI and how, in what all ways, we'll be able to use uh, AI for the betterment of society. I think that's something which we have to keep for the future. But maybe for the spiritual process itself, like is there something we can get from like the AI tools? Or? Oh yeah. So like you said, if you um, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> spiritual knowledge is something which is uh, not see so easily obtainable. Unlike uh, you know, uh, somehow that's a that's uh, you know due to our misfortune we can say that all other branches of knowledge it is very easy to obtain, isn't it? You know, you go to a Google and you search something, you get so much information which you can take out. And uh, there are so many universities teaching the right kind of knowledge. You can go and obtain your knowledge from any of these universities. And it is, it is very easy. If you want to become an engineer, you know which college to go, you know which books to study. And uh, all that information is available very easily. But when it comes to spiritual knowledge, it is not like that. Why? Because spiritual knowledge, unlike the other spheres of knowledge has not been standardized. You see, if you go to, if you come to Stanford University or you go to some university in India or you go to some university in, in any other part of the world, the knowledge that, you will, that will be taught will be more or less the same. Like, you know, it's not that if you come to Stanford, you'll be taught the value of G is 9.81 meters per second square. And when you go to India, they'll say G is 15.72. That's not going to happen, right? Because this knowledge has been standardized. And so across the world, every university uh, teaches you the same, more or less the same aspects of that knowledge. The teaching methodology may differ, the depth of that knowledge may differ, but you, the, 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 the fundamentals will always, always be the same. But in spiritual knowledge, unfortunately, what we have is people are ignorant of the standard of spiritual knowledge, how to assess where we are getting the, uh, you know, the authentic knowledge. And uh, there are too many people out in the market who want to calm the people. So, because th the moment you have large mass of people ignorant, then there will always be people who will try to take advantage of the situation. So hopefully with AI, we will be able to make that uh, authentic spiritual knowledge accessible to most of the people. Like you mentioned, you asked uh, AI a few questions about Dr. Sita and it was able to pull out the answer from whatever the uh, pool of knowledge that AI uh, has available for its use. So, if we make available for the artificial intelligence all the authentic books of knowledge, then for you to be able to retrieve spiritual knowledge also, it will become very easy. That's how I would look at it. Yeah, I think it would really be helpful. Otherwise, like you, it's not easy, as you said, to find uh, like authentic spiritual knowledge. Right? Isn't it? Yeah. Not at all easy. Yeah. You need to have a community. You need to go to the right teacher and like ask questions and all. Yes. That. Yes. Yeah. And more often than not, you know, there was a, you end up in the wrong place, and uh, there are a lot of people who will misguide. All these issues are there. Right. Right. So the standardization which we can do with AI, like to like compress that knowledge into like one system. Exactly. That's the great scope which is available for disseminating spiritual knowledge to benefit the public at large.
Uh, yeah, I have one last question. Like, this is about your personal spiritual journey. So, I think you have a mechanical engineering and like a scientific background. Yeah, that's right. So, and like the way I think about scientists is they are sort of trying to prove that matter can create spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, like that is their whole endeavor, right? Even AI also. Like, yeah. people believe that like they can actually become like sentient beings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but somehow, like, how did you feel that, oh, I should not really do that and like I should, uh, like, move to the spiritual process, right? Yeah, okay, actually, you know, uh, I'd like to, before I go into the personal aspect, I'd like to touch upon one of the points which you said about, uh, you know, how sentient beings can be created by, uh, with the help of artificial intelligence. So we have to understand, like I mentioned, there are so many functions of intelligence, like that there are functions of the mind also, and uh, we, because it is part of the body, the subtle and the gross body, it may be possible to make something which will function better than the way a human intelligence and a human mind works. It is possible. Just like I gave the example of how if we have to, uh, if we have, to have uh, the mode of transport, we have, in, we have discovered and invented uh, modes of transport far more efficient than human beings. If we look at calculators, they can calculate much better than human beings. If you ask a human being a big number and try and ask him to multiply two big numbers, he will, you know, he, he will, he will not be able to do it very efficiently. But a calculator can do it in seconds. So, but then, so all human functions of the body, whether subtle or gross, we can create machines which can do it better. That actually, okay. But then, there is one aspect of ourselves which it is not possible to materially recreate, which is consciousness. And consciousness is what differentiates us from matter, from machines. Machines cannot be conscious. Like for example, I have an eye with which I look at the world. Now we can make a very wonderful camera which works far better than my eye to capture images. But when, the, when that camera captures an image, does it experience Oh, this is a very nice scenery that I'm capturing. Whereas when we look at the world through our eyes, when we look at some nice scenery, we go through that experience. So that experience is because of our consciousness. So the consciousness converts that matter into an experience for us. Otherwise, what is there? Some water is falling, some green trees are standing, there is a blue sky. These are all matter. But a, a particular combination of this matter in a particular way creates that experience of being beautiful to us. Similarly, if you look at music, what is music? Music is all sound waves, different combinations of sound waves. But then, a particular combination of that sound waves, we, 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 we uh, experience it as beautiful music. And particular combination, we say, oh, this is noisy. It's not, it's jarring. So, that, uh, that uh, experiencing personality cannot be recreated by matter. That is a part of a living entity of life itself. Conscious, consciousness cannot be recreated. Otherwise, Prabhupada used to give a very beautiful example. Suppose there is a man who has died and his dead body is lying there. Now, if you look at the dead body, Eyes are there, ears are there, nose is there, heart is there, lungs is there, everything, all components are all intact. But the person had a heart attack, he died. Now, can we inject some chemical into that person and again make him alive and conscious? Not possible. The person is gone. So when the person is dead, we say he has left us, he is no more with us. So what is no more with us? The entire body is there. All the different parts of the human body, the machine of the human body is all there. Eyes are there, ears are there, all the organs are there. But we cannot bring, we cannot say that the person is there. So we say, we know very well that the person has left. So what has left? That is the living entity or the soul, which when it is conscious, it makes the body active. Similarly, even artificial intelligence also, even our own human intelligence also. Intelligence may be there, but there is a person required to make that intelligence function. Similarly, artificial intelligence has also been created by a human being. It did not create itself, right? So, uh, the consciousness 
of a person can never be recreated or created or mimicked. It is not possible. We can mimic the functions of the body, whether the gross body or the subtle body, whether it's the mind, the intelligence, even emoting, which is, uh, which is a function of the mind, all that we can mimic. But you cannot make a conscious living entity, not possible. So that's the essential difference between spirit and matter, which we have to be very clear about. So as far as my uh, background is concerned, you know, although I studied mechanical engineering, the way I look at it is, more than studying mechanical aspects of engineering, the study of engineering, it gives us a certain way of looking at life, way of approaching different uh, aspects of life, which is primarily, uh, you know, as we all know, engineers are problem solvers. They, they, are, they tend to look at the world in a very logical way, trying to understand what is the law behind this, the law of thermodynamics, the law of buoyancy, this law, the law of dynamics, you know, all kinds of laws we study. So, what the interested me about spiritual life when I read the Bhagavad Gita written by Srila Prabhupada was the very logical way in which things about life are explained. In our engineering universities, in the colleges, we are all taught about how this world around us functions. But we are not taught about ourselves. So, the whole spiritual subject matter, especially of the Bhagavad Gita, is concerned with the engineer himself. Who he is, what he is, what are the laws behind the working of the human being? What are the laws which are working, which are making us undergo the problems of birth, death, disease and old age? Why there is distress in some people's lives? Why good people have to suffer? Why bad people enjoy life? You know, th these are all questions about life, which if you come to spirituality, if you come to Bhagavad Gita, they are all answered with explanations of the laws behind, what are the laws working behind them. So, naturally having got that, uh, trained up in that engineering way of looking at things, this, you know, the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita was practically like learning the science, the engineering of the soul. So, that's what interested me very much, the logical explanations given by Prabhupada in the Bhagavad Gita and the, the, the solutions which are given for all the problems we are faced in our life, the larger problems of life and all that which really attracted me and that's how, you know, I came into this uh, field. So it is highly scientific and logical. It is absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I have many more questions, but I think we should open it to the audience to ask some questions. So, our friend here is very eager to let us ask. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank Hare. you so much. Uh, well, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to ask only two in the interest of time and others. Uh, well. So first question was uh, talking about chat GPT and, and all of these uh, all, all of these AI revolution that's going on, right? And, and sentient AI is not very far away. Uh, you were talking about how there is mind, intelligence, then there is identification. Uh, the way I see sentient uh, AI is that will fill that puzzle of the subtle block, which is basically it will uh, fill the identification part. It will make AI more self-aware in some sense. Obviously, we cannot touch the uh, the chat satchit ananda. That that side of things will probably never be uh, explorable by AI. But say I were to create an AI which takes all the works of say Shila Prabhupada and is able to answer any question like how Srila Prabhupada would answer the question um, without any sense of conceit. Just honestly, it is something which is tuned very well. It is a good AI yeah. which does this. Yeah. What does a guru, a, a person guru add on top of this which makes a difference in our lives? Like if, if there is AI which can be, which can fill all the subtle and um, definitely not the gross, but the subtle part of what we could get from a guru. Yeah. Beyond that, the consciousness part of the guru, what would that add independently? Yeah. So actually what happens is, first of all, for a chat GPT or whatever you want, you know, the softwares which will come up, I'm sure there will be many more which will come up like chat GPT. 
and uh, you know this is all part of the business game. Everybody is uh, there to take a uh, piece of the pie out of it. So the knowledge base for that software to be able to give you the answers is coming from where? It has not created that knowledge itself. It is already coming from a spiritual master. It is coming from a spiritual guru. And already Srila Prabhupada has given so many books of knowledge. So what you are doing instead of reading the book, you are uh, uh, reading it through a software. What difference does it make? So ultimately, the knowledge has come from a personality who is a spiritual master. So whether you use chat GPT or you use the actual physical books to read that uh, knowledge which is coming from Prabhupada, or we have a you know nice, very nice software which we use for going through all of Prabhupada's books. Um, you know, unlike chat GPT, uh, this is also a mini chat, chat GPT in one sense because it's called Veda based. And any question we type into that, we'll be able to search what all, all Prabhupada's books have told about that. Of course, chat GPT may do it in a much better way by compiling everything and giving it to a one, you know, summarized answer. But the fact is, already that function is being done by, you know, to some extent by a software already. And uh, uh, if we read Prabhupada's books, what we will do? If we have some questions, we will read the book and try to comprehend it and we will assimilate that and we will make a conclusion. So instead of you are doing it, you are outsourcing that to a software. But ultimately, the knowledge is coming from the spiritual master. So whether you take it through chat GPT or you take it through the books or take it through the software, whichever way you take it, you are connecting with the spiritual master and gaining the knowledge from. That's one aspect of it. Second aspect of it is that for spiritual knowledge, for us to become a conviction in the heart, one necessary aspect as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is Tad Vidhi Pranipadena Pariprasnena Sevaya. We have to repose our confidence and our faith in that spiritual master to be able to, uh, to, be able to assimilate that knowledge. Otherwise, you know, that knowledge will never pick up, it will never seed itself in our heart and it will never become part of our life. We will not be able to follow the instructions which are being given there. So, because this knowledge, unlike the other branches of knowledge that we, that we study in our colleges and schools and universities and all that, that only teaches us to how to deal with the matter and how to, how to manipulate matter and, and take out various outputs from it. That does not transform our hearts. It does not make us change our conceptions of the world, the perspectives that we have about the world. How we function with respect to the world, what is what drives us in this world? Is it, you know, is is what drives us in the world, is it I, you know, what I can get out of this world? Actually, all of us, we all are driven by this fundamental uh, motive that what is there in this world for me. So we want to extract happiness from this material world. And that is what drives all of us in all our activities. But if, when you read Prabhupada's books, whether you, you know, whichever, no matter what, which mode you read, uh, read it through, whether it is chat GPT books or whatever it is, if you are approaching it with the proper, the submissive attitude, it will transform the way you look at the world and the motive for you will be no longer what I can extract from the world. The motive for you will be how I can contribute to Krishna, how I can contribute to the Lord's mission, His purpose behind creating this whole world. You will start seeing a higher purpose in everything. Currently, our, our whole, uh, the only purpose that we see in this material world is how I can become happy. But that will get completely reversed and we will start thinking how I can contribute to the pleasure and happiness of the Supreme Lord, which is a complete revolution in our hearts, which can be created by the knowledge given by a spiritual master in person. That is the, that is the fundamental difference that happens. Is that okay? So, thank you so much. Uh, one last question. Please. Um, so, you were talking about how AI, uh, you're talking about how like AI destroying humans will only happen in movies, it's not something that can happen in reality. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest worry that a lot of 
computer scientists have in this uh, in this respect is it's like how a son could always outshine the father uh, with with intelligence being I mean right now yes we we say that there are these memes that come up which say expectation AI will destroy the humans reality you show a cat and it predicts a dog so that's the level at which it is <laughs> but I'm sure it will improve yeah it will definitely so it will definitely improve. But when it improves, the worry is that what if it grows to an extent that it will, like, like how, a, how a son tends to outshine his father, what if AI grows to an extent and at that time, as you said, it could also be, it could go into the wrong hands and when it is used by the wrong hands, what if... All the very scriptures, but for that you have to go to the right source, you have to go to the authentic source. And this is not something new I'm telling. This is already taught in the Bhagavad Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Devam Parampara Praptam Imam Raja Shreyo Vidhu. This knowledge has to be obtained in the Parampara only. So just like when you go to, when you take a medicine, when you buy a bottle of uh, medicine from the, from the, uh, you know, from the medical shop, you will see that there is a prescription written on that, directions for use. So you have to use that bottle of medicine according to the directions given in that or the prescription given by the doctor. I cannot invent my own way of doing it. Suppose there is a there is a, there is a cup syrup which is given to me, and it says you have to take five ml of this every three hours. And I look at it and I think, okay, five ml if I take, I have to take this for three days. So if I take twenty-five ml in one shot, I can finish it. <laughs> it will have some other. It, 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 instead of curing me, it will create some other disease. So similar way. The Bhagavad Gita itself tells how this knowledge has to be received. If we invent our own way of receiving it, then it will not help. Somebody says Bhagavad Gita is the discussion between a doctor and a patient. Somebody says Bhagavad Gita, there is no actually Purukshetra. Actually Purukshetra is your heart and the five Pandavas are the five senses. All kinds of, uh, you know, uh, they will mislead you like anything. They will not allow you to understand what Krishna is wanting to say. So, ultimate point is, if you want to understand, if you want the proper medicine of the Bhagavad Gita, we have to take it as per the prescription which is given in the Bhagavad Gita, which is to accept it from the proper parampara. Is that okay? Yes, thank you for the answer. And the session was very informative. Thank you. Sir. My Hare pleasure. Krishna. My pleasure. So, yes, please. Uh, so, Kathy, you mentioned that uh, it is not possible for us to teach consciousness to the AI, uh, right? But it is not possible to create consciousness, not okay. a matter of teaching. Okay, right? yeah, they can't incorporate it. Uh, it is in not possible form. because I'll give you one simple example, right? You see, you are conscious of yourself. I am conscious of myself, right? If somebody pricks you with a pain, you will feel the pain. I cannot feel the pain. Somebody pricks me with a pain, with a pain, I can feel the pain, you cannot feel the pain, right? But the fact is, when a thing is pricked, the kind of pain I feel is also the kind of pain you feel. It's not different, right? If somebody pricks you with a pain, a pain you will feel pain. Somebody pricks me with the same pain, I'll start laughing. This is so nice. Will it happen? No, I will also feel pain only. So that means your consciousness and my consciousness, the quality is the same. But I cannot feel your pain, you cannot feel my pain. I cannot feel your joy, you cannot feel my joy. I can empathize with you. I can, if you are undergoing some pain, I can tell that, oh, I understand, I can very well understand what pain you are going through. I can understand, but I cannot experience your pain. So, that means your consciousness is limited to your body, my consciousness is limited to my body. So, my consciousness is separate, your consciousness is separate, although quality-wise it is the same. You understand? So, therefore, consciousness is, is belongs to you, and consciousness, my consciousness belongs to me. It is a property of me as a living entity. So, uh, 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 dead matter like this piece of uh, uh, chair, it cannot be conscious because, because it is not living. So, consciousness is inseparable from a living entity. If there was a, some way how you, by which you could separate consciousness from me, then it is possible to recreate it. But it is impossible to separate consciousness from the living entity. Therefore, it is not possible to create it. I hope you understand. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, yeah, now I understand. Uh, so one thing I wanted to, in recent times, if you see in the AI field, right, they are trying to do something, AI ethics, 
like trying to also teach the morality to the aim, just so that it knows, okay, if I'm... Yeah. There. So, I think according to Bhagavad Gita also there is like dharma, dharma. Yes. So is, but is that something that we can at least bring it with the help of... Yeah, you can, you can incorporate that into the... Yeah. See, the point is, you can... Whatever you teach the AI, it will do. If you teach the AI, if you, if you, you, if you, if you create the bank of knowledge in AI where it has to function in this way, if you program it like that, it will do that. So, the fact is, the AI itself, what that means is, AI does not have free will. Whatever you program, it will function according to that. You, you program it to learn from uh, whatever, you know, iterations and all those kind of things. The way you program it, according to that, it will function. For you and me, nobody has programmed our AI, our intelligence and our consciousness and our, and our uh, sense of discrimination. Nobody has programmed us. We may be taught in moral class, moral science we all learn in school, right? Of course, we don't remember any of those when we grow up. But in moral science we are taught, you should not lie, you should not cheat, you should not steal, all these things we are taught. But eventually when we grow up, whether we use that in that way or not, it's up to us. Every individual is different. That is why the government when it builds a city, it also has to build a prison house. Why? Because it knows there will be some people who will act as criminals. So, you cannot avoid that because that's free will. You cannot have to build a city where there are citizens who will all be law abiding. You cannot create that kind of situation. There will be people who will always use their free will and they will rebel, they will go against the law, all these things will happen. So that free will, you cannot you cannot you cannot create in, in AI. You can only you can only create a program to function in the way you have used your free will to make it work like that. Somebody used this free will and, and programmed with chat GPT to work in that in a particular way. So it works according to that. You understand? So, um, say that someone is actually probably a conscious person yes. who actually works as per divine will yeah. and doesn't use his... So, so I'm saying that the AI that is created ultimately depends on the person who creates it. Yeah. So if he is a conscious person, he or she is a conscious and a say, uh, obeying the divine will, then that could translate, bring that consciousness into the AI, right? Yeah. You can, you can, you can convey your, uh, this one into, into, see, the point is, ultimately, uh, I can, it, with, with my uh, consciousness, with my spiritual consciousness, I have an intention, okay, that I want to, I want to uh, impart the knowledge that I have, the spiritual knowledge that I have to Right? So I can use chat GPT, I can use all these kind of things to impart that knowledge to you. Now, it is up to you to take that knowledge and accept it and follow that or not follow it. Right? So you have to use your individual free will and your consciousness to comprehend it and become convinced that yes, this is something I want to follow and then follow it. In the case of A, there is no conviction required. You don't have to convince there. You just input the, input the information into it, it will accept it. Whereas for you as a, as a conscious person, if I give the knowledge, you will not simply take it like that. You will have hundred doubts. You will want to ask questions. You will want to be convinced. In, in this classroom, uh, if, 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 when, you are, when, you are, when we are having this kind of discussion, if there are 50 people, 40 people may be convinced, 10 people may not be convinced. That's the reality, no? So that's, that's, so, according to the individual free will, you will have to use your free will to accept whatever knowledge I am sharing with you or not. So, consciousness cannot be transferred like that. You understood? I hope you, I got your question right. Thanks. Thanks. Hare. Hare Krishna. Do we have any time left or? So, time to close. So, uh, I should express my gratitude to all of you for uh, patiently listening to this and uh, I hope whatever I have shared with all of you is uh, useful for all of you in some way or the other and I would also request all of you that uh, I have very briefly, very briefly I touched upon the book of knowledge which, which is the Bhagavatam which uh, gives this understanding about intelligence, mind and on. So if all of you can take up the effort to study the Bhagavatam because the Bhagavatam is a book of knowledge which has which is very voluminous. 
I spoke about only one small miniscule part of the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam, the, in comparison, the Bhagavad Gita has 700 verses. And that itself is a big book. The Bhagavatam has 18,000 verses. <laughs> and all of it is full of knowledge. So please try to read the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam. And you will find wonderful knowledge which will, which will be very useful, which will be very beneficial for all. That's my humble request to all of you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, really, really gracious of you to come and talk to us. It's here, my privilege. Here on campus. Um, and it was really wonderful listening to you combine something so contemporary with something which is arguably the most ancient knowledge in the world. And ancient but still relevant. Still relevant. So, thank you so much. Uh, we will spend 10 minutes doing kirtans. In the meanwhile, uh, the food stalls will be set up. So, after kirtan, we can line up for dinner. Uh, at the same time, you can also check out the books in the stalls uh, over here. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Also, um, if you really like this, uh, a small sample of this you will see every Wednesday uh, in the sessions that we have uh, from 7.30 to 9 in GCC Nairobi uh, upstairs. So, uh, we have Sessions, kirtans, followed by prasadam. So you're also welcome to join us uh, every week. On <laughs> Thank you.